Hello, 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 and welcome to the Loudcast with me, your host, Kevin McLean. I am still here, still in my flat and leaf, still bringing you guys some of the very best of spoken word. If this is your first episode of the Loudcast, thank you so much for stopping by. We hope you enjoy the show. We're going to have some amazing poetry performances, and we're going to have a chat with one of my absolute faves, the amazing Dr. Carly Brown. If you're coming back after checking us out for a long time, thank you so much for checking us out. Please do make sure you've subscribed to the YouTube channel so you don't miss any of our videos in the future if you could hit like on this video it would help us out massively and if you're listening on a podcast make sure to do you know whatever your podcast thing tells you to do rate review follow all that good jazz it helps us out massively we are trying to make sure we have a big platform for scottish spoken word because we think it deserves it and if you've been watching the shows over the last few months hopefully you agree Uh, and we're going to be diving into all things scottish spoken word like i said with carly brown in a little little bit but to get us rolling we're going to kick stuff off with a live performance from back when we were able to do shows and stuff uh, with the amazing Mary McCall this was her back at the storytelling center with us at Loud Poets this is Is My depression is a shy dinner guest usually quiet whilst others drink and jest, only speaks aloud when directly addressed, whilst plotting her revenge when no longer suppressed. My depression is a freshly baked cake that triggers my stomach to emptily ache, convinces me to indulge upon a tea break, then leaves me later guilty and awake. My depression is a mystical crystal ball that shows in its depths every potential pitfall, all roads that lead to my downfall, that whilst I steer into has the power to forestall anything happening to me at all. My depression is an insatiable lover, desperate to keep me under bed covers, recovering instantly and demanding another. It knows how much I've always been a sucker for afternoon delight. My depression is the boggart from Harry Potter, taking the form of my fears into my horror, transforming as quickly and flexibly as water. A mirror that shows an image of a failure, a friend, partner, and daughter. My depression is far too many things to list. And whilst it fogs my vision with its heavy mist, it helps me to remember that whilst we do coexist, We are not all that the eye can see. Because my depression is so many millions of things, but none of them are me. Mary McCall there, uh, spectacular stuff. She is such a a wonderful writer and performer. She has a real presence about her on stage, tackles these kind of like big subjects, but always with a real delicacy and and you know thoughtfulness that that rings through all of her work i'm a big big fan of mary mccall go and check out all of her stuff another person i'm a huge fan of is not only the a wonderful poet an excellent writer but he is the producer of the loudcast he is a director of i am loud and he's one of my best buds so please enjoy dancing rain by mark galley I don't carry an umbrella. I'm happy with a hood. Or my hair. It's not that I'm unprepared, not even I'm too lazy to carry one. I have several. Problem is, I like dancing in storms. Not that drizzle spitting shit, not that muggy miserable mist, no, give me heavy rain. Give me rain that thuds when it hits cars. Give me rain that gets mistaken for hail. Give me rain like the wrath of some benevolent being. Give me rain like that night. We didn't care how silly we looked. Swimming shorts, assorted hoodies, mismatched shoes, because all we wanted to do was dance in the rain. Sing to the sound of thunder, see what travels faster, our laughter or lightning. All cares and composure washed away. Give me that raindrop rhythm. Give me that feeling again. 
So thanks. But I don't need the umbrella. This is some dancing rain. Mark Galley there with a, a beautiful piece. Galley often tends to write, you know, insane things. If you've been watching The Happy Hour, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't been, go and check that out. Galley is a wild card element. Uh, but I think here he kind of returns to what I would consider uh, a bit of his bread and butter, how he kind of got started, which is these very like evocative, emotional pieces. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful piece. And he put together the video for it, which is very cool. If you're watching the video version of this, you'll have seen it. If not, I'd advise you, go and jump over to the YouTube channel. Check it out. Mark has been putting out a kind of weekly video release where he's you know doing some very cool editing stuff we're trying to give you guys more variety here on the youtube channel trying to make sure we're, we're delivering stuff that you want to see and i think galley has been doing a top-notch job so go and check out those videos give them a like and you know pat him on the back for all of his hard work but for now we move on uh, to someone else who writes insane just like galley uh they're my faves though to be fair hey uh, we move on to the weird and wonderful angie strachan supermarket tart um, this is a poem for any supermarket tarts out there. I'm one of them. Oh, how I love you, Aldi. With all your random temptations, I go in for a tin of beans and come out with a tin of beans and a chainsaw. <laughs> and even though I try to stick to a list, you always insist I come out with a whole load of shit I never went in for. So I contemplate all of these newfound Aldi pursuits as I eat my Aldi cheese in my Aldi wetsuit. <laughs> and this is a true poem from the heart from a self-confessed supermarket tart. I flirted with your brother Little and dined al fresco with a sandwich outside Tesco. But Aldi, I would give all of that up for you, my Sainsbury's Nectar Points, my Marks and Spencer's dying for two because it's you, Aldi, and all your random temptations. <laughs> Give me your juicy rump steak love in your air jet spa pool hot tub. Lay me on your foldable pasting table. Tempt me with your tasty nibbles. Wrap me in your pink polyester sports bra while feeding me your Titan toffee biscuit bars. Fill my cupboards with your condiments and sugar. Service them with your cordless screwdriver. Get me tipsy on your award-winning Prosecco as I clean my windows with your long, extendable, multi-purpose pole. <laughs> you make me feel special with your offers and 39p parsnips and self-propelled petrol lawnmowers. For the love of everything that is edible, you make my butter spreadable. <laughs> For the love of everything that is junk, fill my garage with your random temptations. I'm your dedicated housewife. Wheel me down your shopping aisle. Let me be your bag for life. <laughs> but Aldi, this is not just about household economies or beans or chainsaws or where I get my messages. It's about you, Aldi, and all your random temptations. Thank you. <laughs> And that was Angie Strachan with Supermarket Tart. What an incredible piece. Angie is such a unique writer and performer. She has a style very much of her own and a very unique twist on, on any idea that she puts forward. If you haven't also checked out the Ayrshire Seagull Massacre, uh, which is another of her poems available on the I Am Loud YouTube channel, then please do make sure to check that out if you're watching the YouTube version of this. There will be a link or an eye or something that someone else does in post so we move on to chat about angie's poem and a whole bunch of other stuff with our guest today she is a uh, writer of fiction a spoken word artist a published poet she is a doctor that's right another doctor in the house <laughs> please welcome to the show and give it up for dr carly brown how's it going carly it's going great. Thank you so much for having me. I've been listening to the podcast for quite a while, so I'm very excited to be to be here with you. Hello. That is so nice to say. I am 
always surprised uh, when people watch um, <laughs> like it's like a nice confirmation that I must not be insane and just screaming into the void uh, so it's no nice. <laughs> no you're screaming into my headphones and it's great I love it <laughs> good good well thank you very much uh, for coming on it's been ages since I've seen you how have you been doing in you know the nightmare zone that we live in now <laughs> it's a good way to describe it yeah I've been doing okay I think as as okay as 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 you can be I actually have been writing a lot uh during the lockdown which is has been good but yeah I'm really missing um interactions with with people in in person and I'm so excited that it's starting to change a little bit and we're kind of coming out of our little our little caves and and starting to be able to be together again because I think it was it was a hard you know year and a half for for it's it's a very uh apt apt description for it that it very much feels like coming out of hibernation that sort of tentative like creep out see if it's still winter is it safe yes yes exactly kind of scope out the landscape like what's going (laughs) on out there but no it's been wonderful to be able to kind of slowly emerge um kind of into the light and you know see if people uh, again yeah. yeah yeah but i have no doubt you've been keeping busy during lockdown i know carly very well and if you uh, followed her work you'll know she is always doing stuff and writing one of the more prolific uh, poets that i know uh, but before we get into all of your stuff carly did you enjoy supermarket tart Oh my gosh, did I enjoy it. Like, I watched it twice in a row, and I just was giggling so much, like, both times. I absolutely loved it. I I think, like, my favorite line was probably about, like, the can of beans. It's like, <laughs> I go in for a can of beans, and I come out with a can of beans and a chainsaw. <laughs> and I was like, this is an amazing, <laughs> this is an amazing poem. It was just, it was absolutely hilarious. And I, I don't have, like, a personal relationship relationship with Aldi like in particular but I very much have like an understanding of like what she's talking about um just the kind of like impulse buys of all the like random stuff you're kind of like seduced by at the supermarket so I absolutely love that it was hilarious as a full-time poet I uh, Aldi is my supermarket of choice um, so I, I, I love going to Aldi because of that specific reason the the long centre aisle of random bins <laughs> of chaos it's a lot of fun and Angie hits the nail right on the head she's so good at taking a, like a very base concept like uh, a supermarket trip or eating a chippy at the seaside or whatever it is and just turning it up and turning it up until it's just this fever dream of a situation yeah that's such a good way to describe it and I loved how it kind of like it does build in that way which is so just comedic and wonderful that the that the the the, in the Aldi poem and I know the other poem that you're referencing too with the seagulls that it kind of just like it goes and goes and goes until it's this hilarious like kind of hyperbolic energetic like sort of massacre of the seagulls or like you know kind of talking about like uh, just wearing like an an Aldi like scuba suit and (laughs) eating the like Aldi cheese and I just like I was like I love this like surreal absurd chaotic wonderfulness and and I like that she goes she totally goes there and like really totally explores that like premise and it starts with that conceit and then goes the full way I love it it's 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 incredible work obviously i'm i'm a big fan of you know the performance end of of poetry more than the kind of the writing i guess like i you know you need you need both but i I love someone like angie whose poems are so elevated by the live performance like man yeah the she the same thing you say in her pacing of of the piece right like the the writing you know builds and builds to this sort of chaotic crescendo but she does the same in the performance you know she like starts off almost like a recital you know like what you would expect from a poem but then slowly but surely it turns into this like yeah breakdown kind of piece it's very it's it's really really good performance skills yeah, it's super true. And I think especially at the beginning of the poems, like um, with the Aldi one, you know that it's kind of a love poem and you don't know where it's going to go. And I think that you're exactly right that her performance absolutely like mirrors that kind of like escalation and her escalation of like energy is just like is so perfect. I think it would it would be so fun to see to see live and you can hear you know, how well it's going down with, with the audience, you know, going on that, like that, that ride with with her, I could hear the appreciative, 
giggles. So yeah, and I was I was giggling as I was you know watching it on my own. So yeah, it's great. <laughs> Good, I'm glad. I'm glad. Angie, yeah, is it, spectacular. But the reason, uh, other than it kind of being a new release that we just brought out, uh, I thought it, it fit really well uh, with kind of like starting off a conversation with yourself because I think there's some real parallels in the sort of uh, stylistic approach um, between you and Angie in your your sort of live performance stuff, where you two do very like a very performance driven where like the the performance really has to you know measure up to the to the writing and you do these kind of like heightened situations like when i think of uh poems like your your piece uh texas i can't bring you to parties anymore like the the sort of you know the heightened situation the kind of like it's it's a, a simple thought but but twisted into like maybe the the relationship or the personification of the state right it's you use these kind of tools to make something that could be done in a very dry literal way into something much more spectacular oh thank you well i'm 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 very flattered to be yeah to be compared to to angie because i really i really did um enjoy enjoy that poem and her work and i think that's absolutely true and i can super see those those parallels that you're talking about both in terms of the performance i think both of us do have that that style that does where performance is very is quite important you know and and does highlight and is the content of of the poem in a lot of ways but i think also both of us do that like personification thing um and i think yeah for me that's such a great tool at least as i'm writing for like working out my feelings about things um so yeah with something like like texas you know i think it's it's a poem you know about in many ways like conflicting feelings um and you know being protective of a place and defensive of it as well as being kind of um, embarrassed and disdainful of it. So that works really well if you like personify it and you're just like, I'm having a conversation sort of with a, a person because people can have all that stuff, that messy stuff kind of bound up in them. And it makes it a little bit easier, I think, than like, you know, a poem about an entity. Because if I would were to think, oh, I want to write about Texas, I think that would feel like too much for me. But if you make it like a person, it's almost like you're having a conversation and it makes it, at least for me, a little bit easier to kind of process some of those like messy, messy, messy feelings. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's a, it's a totally like bang on point because I, I find it interesting and maybe it's you know more when p before people kind of build a, a you know experience in their writing I feel that like poetry the big tool of poetry right the, the best thing about it is the abandoning of the literal the abandoning of you know having to do things to uh you know a sort of narrative structure or or a, you know you can use extended metaphor and stuff that you can mm -hmm. in in other forms of writing so like when people sit down to do a poem about something they care about a great deal to then just speak about it so directly rather than finding like a a kind of a skew way to approach it and i think there's something in that that you and angie both really do like a lot yeah. of your work talks about big issues you know like if you look at a poem like you have um your anastasia poem right the 50 shades mm -hmm. of gray poem when you look at that piece you know you're not like attacking the readers of that book or yeah. the book itself or even the main character it comes from like an empathetic place and the same with texas you're not like yeah. boo texas and its politics you're like it you know it feels like a poem written before the breakup where you're still trying to fix the relationship yeah and I think that's, yeah, a very cool way to approach stuff. Is that a deliberate kind of like to do those, you know, per, to do persona pieces and personify, you know, the, the subjects you're talking about? Yeah, I think so. And I think that is such, um, it's such an insightful, honestly, like reading of those, those poems, Kevin. Also, it's, it's something that really, it means a lot, like when you say it, because, you know, I really do want to be approaching these like, yeah, sometimes quite like, you know, messy, like topics with <laughs> like, yeah, with like com compassion. And like, I love that you said empathy. And I think that absolutely, that's, that's something that, that I'm, I'm thinking about, maybe not always on like a conscious level, but it's definitely there that I'm like, I want to work through this um, on just like a human level. Like, what does it mean for me to be like from this place that I'm embarrassed by as well as like 
proud of in like different ways. And, and I think kind of trying to approach, um, to approach both myself and the topic with, a, yeah, with like compassion and, <laughs> and all that stuff. I think, I think that, that that's absolutely something that's, that's at the back of my mind, like definitely. And to allow for those like complications and, and stuff as well that you can, you know, that you can have those, those messy kind of like contradictions and stuff, I think. But the fact that you said like, you know, with, that empathy i think is that that really yeah thank you (laughs) but i think it's important i think it it, it, and it's why you know your work resonates because i i don't think it's you you know kevin gilday very well and i often quote his line the you know i'm glad i'm glad you told us racism was bad until you came to the stage we had no idea and it's you know in his uh poem i've fallen out of love with poetry i remember that poem yeah yeah it's that idea of like who are you speaking to, right? When you see these poems that are very blunt, direct, you know, rallying cry pieces, Mm -hmm. you go, who is that aimed at? Either people who already agree with you or it's going to like, the the hostile tone of it is going to, you know, potentially alienate people who would hear your idea better Mm -hmm. if it was, you know, delivered with a bit of, uh, empathy, a bit of softness, you know, maybe a, a bit of a metaphorical and, take and or an hu- And humor one. too. I think humor is a pretty powerful tool in those kinds of like contexts as well, because I think sometimes if you're, and, and all the stuff you, you, you know, you, you said as well, I, I think humor is just another one to add, you know, kind of on top of that, you know, I think that, you know, audiences are so much more receptive to hearing about most things as well as just like kind of taking in what you're saying if it's from a more like lighthearted place sometimes like even if the topic is like a heavier topic I think if you have that like humorous um thing and I think like one of my theories for why that is is that's that's just how people talk like when you're not performing when you're not like on stage like people are trying to make each other laugh I think a lot of the time or at least I am like not always successfully but I feel like I'm trying to like make people laugh like when I engage with them and so I think audiences feel that almost like like attempt at a at a at a conversation if you're kind of if you're using that humor because people are funny i mean people are always trying to make their friends laugh they're trying to kind of like find the humor in different situations so i think if you go that humor route like that makes people just i think a lot more willing to engage with whatever that like topic is and then they might at the end of the day come out with saying oh i don't agree with you know that person about that particular thing or oh i don't maybe even i didn't really like that poem but i think you know to to use that humor tool i think has a little bit of that kind of it's it's a little bit of that invitation to just like and it shows that you're I mean, I am taking these topics seriously, like in the Anastasia poem, in the the Fifty Shades of Grey poem um, that we were talking about, which does touch on topics that I really do, you know, care about. Um, sexuality and gender and and representations of women in literature and all these things like it does really matter to me but I also think if you approach it with that kind of comedic lens people are sometimes a bit more likely to be like I see what you're I see what you're saying instead of if you come at them with like there's so many problems with this book which I can totally understand just going the screaming route as well and sometimes I I do that and I want to do that but I think you know humor is something to to keep in mind too people don't like hearing by the way the thing you like sucks and then you (laughs) suck for liking it you know what I mean like that's that's, it wouldn't be a good place to start maybe and so even even if people listen to your like Fifty Shades of Grey poem and, and like still like nah she's wrong I like this book it's good at least they'll have listened right whereas if you come out with a very hostile approach right away that person who might you know be encouraged to at least think slightly more critically about the what they're you know reading would immediately shut off you know they're like don't like this and it's what what you know we often find you know people think people have two perceptions of poetry right either that it's like uh kind of stuffy old people reading you know i don't know for <laughs> like Walt Whitman or whatever or yes. it's like Walt Whitman's not a good uh, <laughs> no I think you're absolutely right I think that is like a perception that I think a lot of people or, definitely still have or yeah, even like Shakespeare like, like, like yeah. they, that's what they think of yeah. charging the light brigade or whatever you know what I mean those kind of things mm-hmm. or they think of like lefty woke kids doing you know 
like trauma based poetry mm-hmm. and like they're, they're, both those things exist right but like I think the the pity is that most people don't realize the, the vast majority of like spoken word exists in the middle ground of that where there's yeah. the, like most spoken word artists are taking into account the want to be entertaining or the want to have a conversation rather than doing these kind of like intense you know screw you you're wrong pieces yeah absolutely and i think you know i've 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 had conversations with you know family members and i, I think that that at least when I've, I've spoken with yourself and other members of of, of the, you know loud poets and, and other spoken word poets they've had similar experiences where i've had people tell me oh i don't like poetry but i like your poems <laughs> you know yeah. and I, I yeah it's it's something that i think um you know happens a lot and i'm always you know, obviously, I'm happy that my poems have connected with that person. And that's a wonderful thing. And maybe it did like open that door. But I always try to tell them that like, you know, saying that you don't like poetry is kind of like saying that you don't like music, like there's probably something (laughs) out there that you will like, you know, and it might not be a Shakespearean sonnet, although it could be a Shakespearean sonnet, don't like discount it, like you could really like that. But I think just knowing that there's that breadth and depth and that there's so many different types of of poetry out there is something that I really hope that, you know, I try to like, if someone tells me, oh yeah, I don't like poetry, but I liked this poem or I liked your poem. I try to always be like, you'll like other poems. I promise, you know, <laughs> like there's some, there's something else out there for you. And I think, yeah, it sounds like you, yeah, maybe we've had a similar experience. I think we've, we've talked about this before, but I, I hope that, yeah, I hope it serves as like a little bit of like a gateway, you know, for, for some people to then explore other, other types of poetry <laughs> that they will certainly like certainly enjoy there's so many there's so many different types so. the interesting yeah. thing is even within like it, you're a very good uh, example to use here for this actually because that person saying that to you is probably someone who's maybe seen you at a live gig right right yes. and you go you're live sets like you were saying before you use humor as like a huge tool so like most of your spoken word sets that i've i've seen right you have been very performance based, very high energy, very uh, you know, like those kind of persona PCs or personification PCs rather than, you know, deep confessional like first person mm-hmm. stuff. And so it would be easy to go, oh, Carly Brown is a performance, you know, comedy stand up poet. But then that would I've been entirely, called that before. Yeah. I've definitely been called that before. <laughs> but that entirely discounts all the work you do on the page, which is, you know, a place where you still use humor and then things like that, but you have a more, you know, varied toolbox, right? Because it's a different audience. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, like, do you find that? Is that what you're then doing with published work? Because I know you have uh, Anastasia, Look in the Mirror, right? And uh, your first pamphlet, Grown Up Poetry Needs to Stay Away From Me, which is, or Get Away From Me, which is just an amazing <laughs> To leave title. me alone. Yeah, to leave me alone. <laughs> that's it that's it an amazing title thank uh, you are those places that you use to then write a kind of like you know dip into those areas that you maybe don't use in live sets yeah absolutely and I think that you know you're super right that that I, I do think about you know the different audiences that um that I'm writing for and also the different just contexts and, and and mediums that I'm producing that work for because I know that all spoken word poets don't don't work in this way you know everybody is different but I tend to when I'm writing a spoken word poem um, or a kind of a performance poem I'm thinking about those elements of live performance and I'm thinking about you know maybe because I have a theatrical background I'm thinking you know can I bring in a character or can I you know do a funny voice or can I um, you know how will this translate to an audience who's seeing it for the first time maybe they're never going to see it again maybe they're a little tipsy maybe they um you know someone is taking a nap you know you want to like perform something that or at least I'm trying to create material that is um engaging to see in a live performance context whereas if you're you know working on something that you're thinking is going to be on the page and actually a lot of what I write is is fiction I'm working on a historical fiction novel um I've written a a kid's picture book like a children's picture book um that has like a read aloud quality you know but it's it's you know it's a a picture book and I I write short stories I've written essays um and I do, I do keep in mind, like, how are people going to be, um, imbibing is the word that came to mind. Like, how are people going to be, 
uh, in, you can tell with, she's a doctor. In, <laughs> yeah, in but, I don't know why that came <laughs> into my mind, but like, how are they? And then the other one that came was ingesting, as if Ooh. they're like kind of just like balling up the stories and like eating the paper. But how how are they? How are they going to be like taking in this stuff? Um, so I do I do keep those those things in mind um, because you know, that's just part of, that's part of my like writing process. Um, and I think both of them have, have, have different tools, have different opportunities that I know so many, um, you know, people who, uh, guests that you, that you've had on have, have discussed some of those, those different options that you have in those different contexts. Um, but I really try to, yeah, to keep that in mind. Um, so that whatever it is that I'm trying to like explore is like, um, is explored in the most effective way possible. And whatever it is that I'm trying to say, or whatever sort of story that I'm trying to tell is, um, best like using those particular, like those particular tools basically. Yeah, for sure. It's, I, I think it's a, a standard that should be set. Like I think too often, not that people focus on the writing too much. That's not what I'm saying. Right, focus on your writing. That's good to do. But I think the uh, the second part of it is taken as read, and it's like why spoken word poets have always kind of right. It's the beef between poets who don't consider themselves like performers, right? That like, well, it's not a real aspect. You know, anyone can read their poem or whatever, and it does such a disservice to the hard work and the 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 impact it has on the writing. Like I always try and put forward to folk when I write a spoken word poem. It needs to be understood in the time it takes to read it. And that changes my vocabulary. It changes like the way I present a thing. If I'm writing a page poem, I can that person can read it over and over and over okay. and over again till till they understand it. And like that's what it comes to is understanding the intention behind the piece. To just be like, Well, I wrote a poem and now I'm gonna read it out, so I'm a performance poet is not like the yeah. reality of the situation. Yeah. And you see and it, that when yeah. you see someone like your, you know, work, like you could go and do, say, say you were doing stanza and I, you know, not to like points, like stanza do really well at incorporating good performance poets. But if you were doing main stage stanza, you would approach that in a different way than you would if you were doing the spoken word, you know, pint and a pie set at stanza yes. because the audience yeah. expect different things. Absolutely. No, I think that that's absolutely true. And, you know, again, this is just for me because I do recognize that, you know, there there are people who are, say, like fiction writers who, yes, they write, you know, um, novels or, or whatever, but then they, they read them really well. You know, yeah, it's not yeah, to say yeah. that they might not be wonderful kind of like performers, but sort of what I'm talking about from the perspective of my my craft if, if you want to call it that my like literary craft is thinking about the kind of end goal when you know, when you're working on it and it yeah. sounds like that's something that that you do too and I think a lot of of kind of performance poets or spoken word artists do do have that in mind and you know you have to think about timing you have to think about um you know audiences attention spans you have to think about the balance between um I guess like light and dark in maybe a slightly different way than you would think about it for someone reading, um, especially someone who can maybe take a break, yeah, yeah. you know, getting that balance just right, um, transitions between pieces and how are you gonna frame it. Um, you could even go so far as to say that, you know, you think about like how, how you're going to maybe like dress on stage, maybe all black, like, you know, you have to think, you know, yeah. I think all of these elements and maybe this is because I come from a theater background and I'm used to um, to acting and kind of keeping in mind a lot of these choices. But I think, and obviously the wonderful Katie Ailes does fantastic you know, research and, and, and work kind of dealing with some of these topics, but they are, uh, these, these, these are choices that, that performance poets make that are, are, are well thought through and that are kind of well considered. And it's not just kind of someone sauntering up and then just like giving a spiel yeah. and then sitting down, you know, these, these are things that, um, you know, that we practice and that we rehearse, um, like any other craft and that we perform in front of friends and then we tweak it and then we perform it in front of our dog and then the dog doesn't like it and then we tweak it and then you know we perform it in front of you know then we time ourselves and it doesn't work and we have to shave it off so I think I, I really love you know podcasts like like this one that kind of or resources like this one rather that kind of like just 
yeah, tell the, 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 the truth about that aspect of the writing process that it is a process, you know, and it is, um, it is a craft. And I it's think something you, that... you, you strike that perfect middle ground as well, because I think you can lean too far the other way. Like I find a lot of, uh, particularly sort of like North American um, slam poets, it, it's almost like too choreographed, like unnecessary sort of strange mm. movements and things like that. Mm. That's not particularly my cup of tea. I think mm. you walk that perfect line of like, it should feel spontaneous. It should feel like the first time you're reading a piece, but you should have made sure that you're aware of everything you're doing. You know, I mean, it shouldn't be the first time you're reading the piece. And I think you're bang on when you say there's a difference between someone who reads their work very well and someone who is deliberately incorporating performance you know in the creation of the p- and delivery of the piece i think there's a yeah. big difference yeah yeah, yeah yeah and i'm definitely in the kind of latter camp of someone that yeah exactly as you said you put it super well that um yeah just incorporates that element in the creation of it that's something i'm thinking about i'm thinking about what's this gonna be like when i read it to an audience and then it's always interesting too when you do read it to an audience and then you know or they perform it for an audience and then they laugh at a part that you had no idea (laughs) was going to get a laugh yes or um you they don't laugh even (laughs) worse when you had this bit that you're like this is hilarious oh man like like, give me my, like, you know, Oscar. I don't know why you'd get an Oscar for writing a funny spoken word poem, you know, but you're you like, deserve yeah, one, Carly. yeah, you just, you feel like you deserve it. You're like, this is hilarious. And then you, you perform it live and then, you know, a couple of times of that and people don't react the way that you expect them to. And I think, you know, every audience is different too. So I think that's something as well to keep in mind in terms of like the whole, idea of writing for for a certain audience because you know every time that you perform a piece which is actually a pretty beautiful thing it's a unique experience with that group of people so and that context so they might not you know be in the mood for a particularly (laughs) funny poem or they might sort of chuckle inwardly and kind of um sort of nod but not not react in the way that maybe you're used to in like a crowded kind of student bar, which is a lot of where I started performing now, like many now several years ago. Um, I was used to really kind of raucous and fun and audible reactions. And then when you go to other contexts, that's not how the audience is used to reacting. So I was always thinking, oh, I'm, I'm doing something wrong or I'm not, um, you know, I'm not doing a, a good job with my performance, but actually it's just a different context and they might not be, um, you know, used to, to reacting in, 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 in that way. Um, so I think it's, that's useful to keep in mind as well, especially for kind of new, new spoken word poets or people that are slightly more new to performance is that it might not be that that it's not going well it just might be that that audience is reacting in a different way because they're a different group of people it's a different context you know this is a a a sleepy library you know reading at like 3 p.m on a sunday (laughs) and they're not going to be like going yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know like raucously (laughs) cheering so i think that's useful because i early on thought oh, that was awful. Oh, that really didn't go well. But actually, then I would have people come up and say, I really liked that. You know, or, oh, that really resonated with me for for X, Y, Z reason. And you're like, really? It was just crickets. And so I think, especially if you perform that more performative work that in some contexts does get more of an audible reaction, it's, it's useful to to keep that in mind, I think. I think that's so Context insightful. Because like, poetry audiences are weird anyway. Like, you know what I mean? The, I think... You know, art forms, we always talk about there's like shared vocabulary, right, within an art form, even if it's not technically right, people know what you mean and things like that. I think that exists within audiences as well. Like a comedy audience knows the the way it's supposed to behave. A Mm theatre audience knows the way it's supposed to behave. Like Like a musical audience is really interesting. You don't clap after every song, but the whole audience knows which songs to clap after the big numbers. And there's, (laughs) there's, we haven't developed that for spoken word yet. And so you need to do it by yourself on stage. Like I take, I have, I always have a drink on stage with me and I take a sip after every poem because it makes, makes the audience clap 
but then you see a poet who's maybe a bit nervous and they go from one poem straight into the next and people don't know if the poem's ended because it's not like a piece of music it doesn't round off it, there's no punchline like a joke it's yes. yeah the, yes. the, we need to we need to create that for the audience as well and you do yeah. such a great job at like framing your poems you're one of the clearest like this poem is done people i know without just saying thank you um at the end or taking the sip or whatever like it's yeah. it's you need to have all that i think it's fascinating but but what i think is really interesting is you then translate that I'm taking to... a sip by the way just, just so <laughs> yeah, keep, keep going but i just i as you were saying that i was like i'm thirsty <laughs> i i think it's so uh, interesting how well your work translates to the page and I, you can see how much effort you've put in in your your pamphlets um to make that the case like do you is that difficult for you to transition you know what are very sort of live pieces into into your work because some of the stuff that is presented on stage does make it into your pamphlets right yeah yeah you know it is difficult and I think with both of my two pamphlets it was a slightly different experience for each because with the first one you know live performance even though it is written down is really a central thing even on the page because that pamphlet grown-up poetry needs to leave me alone um was a collaboration with an American artist called Lydia Cruz, who um, is a fantastic writer herself, but also kind of illustrator and, and graphic designer. And she made it so that the poems on the page were reflecting my like live performances. So basically the poems on the page look like her interpretation of how I perform it in a sense. So like if I would like yell a word, she might like bold it or italicize it or do something like that. So we work together to create the pamphlet, um, that pamphlet, and they're my words, but they're kind of, it's almost her art in a way because it's her interpretation of that live performance. And for me, that was perfect because I was like, how on earth am I gonna get these like really, to me, performative, you know, poems, as, as you said, to, to, to on the page in a way that reflected the kind of like dynamic I guess nature of them being performed live and I didn't know how and I just thought I'll make a CD you know and and that's it but then she had this idea and I was like whoa that is a fantastic um kind of middle ground there and that was really fun to do and then the second one the pamphlet with um with Jude Rhubarb Press, the one that um, came out last year, Anastasia Look in the Mirror, that one was a little bit different in the sense that it was some spoken word poems, as well as some, some, for lack of a better word, like page poems or things that I had written with the intention of them being read primarily. So mm -hmm. I have a couple of ekphrastic poems in there about the Scottish colorist painters that were never, in my mind, like strictly performance poems or things that I intended to regularly perform aloud as well as like a poem about like the Salem witch trials and all kinds of other stuff that I really intended them to be read um and again that's just me that's my like practice is having those a bit separate but in the end the pamphlet is really a mishmash that I think works together as like a whole of like spoken word and like page poems they're thematically linked and I think they work well together but it was definitely yeah a challenge especially with the spoken word poems and I was lucky enough to be able to work with with Katie Ailes wonderful you know I am loud it's Katie Ailes um to um kind of do that almost that translation to another um another medium in a sense or another like mode of of um of transmission of sharing and so uh that it was it was a little it was a little difficult um yeah not not gonna lie because i i never thought that this was going to be their kind of final form and in a way it's not it's one of their forms which is cool in itself it's one of the ways that you can experience those poems and it's one of the ways that you can interact with them but you can also um watch some of the videos you know you can watch you can come see me live you know hopefully sometime soon <laughs> um so i think it's cool to be like this is one life of the poem this is one way that it's gonna live but also it has other kind of lives too and i think that takes some of the pressure off of like how am i gonna like put this on the page and and sometimes it just doesn't work that well sometimes writing it down it just you you lose a little bit of that magic because you wrote it for the stage so you wrote it it's almost like reading a play 
you know, yeah. would be like the closest analogy that I could give. Because again, coming from a theater background, I, I, I almost wrote these as sort of like scripts. And I, and I think that it's almost like reading a play. It's cool to read a play, but you kind of want to see the play. <laughs> it's not quite the same. Not quite the same. But I think that's a, it's, it's interesting what you said about the the sort of mishmash and like the it being thematically linked because that's what I found reading it and it's like it's like you said right it's a different kind of vibe and where you know you can't read all those poems together right in a set and some of them weren't intended to be that or whatever so the 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 collection becomes its own thing that right cool maybe that specific poem or that specific poem you would deem you know quote unquote better right to see live than than on the page Mm -hmm. but in existence with the other pieces formatted the way they are collected in that one piece of work with the the thematic linking of it all like that gives it something extra right That, that that makes up for what a single poem might lose you know from the transition it it gains from being bound up with these other pieces i think wow that is so kind and i've not actually heard someone put it to me in quite that way before but that really means a lot to me because i i hadn't thought of it in quite that way that it's almost like the sum of the parts kind of what's that phrase like becomes greater that greater than the sum of its parts yeah is the that, whole, is the that whole right? is greater the than whole, the sum of its whole parts. is greater than the sum of its parts where yes i might be a little bit like reticent a little bit worried about like ooh, does this poem read that well when i really intended it to be performed but when you look at them all together it's a totally different thing and i really love that interpretation kev i'm gonna like run with that and that that was so <laughs> that's so um yeah that makes me really happy to hear because i do think that they work as like a unit but i hadn't quite thought of it in just that way before so that's really that's really special thank you it's no and thanks for I, reading like, it yeah no it's, it's a wonderful book and you should get your copy if you're watching or listening to this there will be links where you can uh, go and grab uh, a copy of uh, carly's books they're amazing uh so yeah go and check that out and i, I all you all your work carly is is fascinating the the you know the fact that you write so varied like the kids book is beautiful uh just like visually and the writing is is stunning and like i'm fascinated by people that can code switch that way like i find it very difficult to break out of you know kind of preset rhythms and things that i have i found it you know writing to form has been my absolute bane because i've had to abandon all my like true and tested you know tricks Whereas, like, you seem to thrive in that, you know, going from, you know, like, your daughter is in writing, like, historical fiction, but you're also, like, a very celebrated spoken word artist. You were, like, Scottish uh, slam champion and stuff and went and represented us at Worlds. Like, that just seems like such a massive code switch for me, which is, is, is very, very impressive. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't exactly, and I know exactly what you mean, and I don't know why, um it doesn't feel like too much of a shift for me. And I think over time I've realized that at least for me, it's one of the reasons there's probably, there's probably other reasons, but I think one of the reasons is that I explore a lot of similar ideas and similar topics, but just in different, in slightly different ways. But I think it doesn't feel like a total switch because Mm. I'm still often thinking about like similar stuff. So maybe that's partly why, Um, but yeah, they are different and I, I like, I like being able to explore kind of yeah different things. It's it's even present in your work. Like I I think we have a somewhat of a similarity in terms of I hate writing about the same thing. Like I always want every poem to be like the the some opinion on a certain subject or, or, or topic or whatever. And while like things yep themes and you know things run through because you're a person who's attracted to the, the you know similar topics. Certain ideas, yeah. But like your varied approach to even just if you look at your spoken word output, like you know, you talk about like Fifty Shades of Grey and Great Gatsby and, you know, the state of Texas and, you know, Christmas and all these like wild and disparate ideas. And I find it so interesting that like so much of your work is kind of ekphrastic. Uh, for people, if you don't know what ekphrastic is, Carly mentioned it before, but it's it's works primarily uh, or, or originally, I guess the idea was based on uh, pieces of visual art. So like, like Carly was saying, the, the Scottish colorists, um, but it can you know be on anything. You could take something like uh, Fifty Shades of Grey or Twitter as a sort of starting point, right? That, that's how I kind of see it frastic. 
is that like a, a deliberate choice to like you know vary up topic matter um yeah i don't know if it was a deliberate choice to vary up topic necessarily but i'm i'm someone that really enjoys writing with like prompts or just like going to a writing workshop on you know x topic that i haven't kind of explored before or thought about um so i think the ekphrastic thing is really cool f- for me because you can just you know pull up a painting that you like an image of it online or go to a gallery when you know it's possible to go to galleries and <laughs> just kind of see what comes up for you and i think you know for me that's a little bit easier sometimes than just like sit down and like just write a poem just like staring at a blank page so i i like going to yeah galleries or just like looking at at an image and then seeing what kind of like story or um themes it kind of like generates in in me so i think that's how in particular those like colorist poems started because i used i used to live in glasgow and i lived by kelvin grove art gallery which is a really beautiful art gallery and it had a lot of like paintings by these scottish colorist painters so i would go on like an afternoon on a rainy day which is you know a lot of days um in glasgow <laughs> and i would go in and just stare at the paintings and then kind of set myself that um that challenge i guess of of um yeah of trying to respond to the to the painting so i think it's that loving of prompts <laughs> give me a prompt and and uh, yeah yeah i mean and what you mentioned earlier i think is very true about liking to explore different different topics as well it does bring up a challenge in terms of i guess um i hesitate to use the word like branding or like marketing but it's it, it is a little tough when i'm describing my work to others to say what topics do you write about you know and you're like you're like i'm like santa tesco 50 shades of gray sexuality history art you know it's like it's what a subjects you've different... got my friend yeah exactly <laughs> give me a subject i've got a poem for you um but yeah i i think the way i i typically or i've started describing it is that i write about history desire and the unexpected places where the personal meets the political Damn, <laughs> that is some tight coffee. Wow. There, there you go. And I, and I, and I, but I feel like that that could change tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So anyone, anyone watching or listening that needs bio tips, just drop a wee email there, to Carly. She there, loves uh, writing this. this. <laughs> Well, it's so much easier to describe other people's work as well, isn't yeah, it? It's very yeah, yeah. challenging to describe your your own because you're like, I write things, I write about things, but you know, for all sorts of different different <laughs> opportunities and and various things, you need to be able to, um, uh, or you're frequently asked to um, succinctly describe what topics you're interested in. So at the moment, I would say those. <laughs> That's yeah, it, yeah. Hard to narrow down for you, Carly. Hard to exactly it down. what you're up to, <laughs> like <laughs> fascinating stuff, Carly. I could pick your brain all day about uh, spoken word, and we are going to continue the chat uh, over on the Loudcast Extra. So if anyone hasn't jumped over to the Patreon channel yet, you can sign up for like a tiny amount, like a quid or whatever, which is you know just let, no money so go and do that and you get a bunch of wonderful extras you can put a suggestion in the poetic pint glass of poetic challenges over on the happy hour uh, you can yeah, get extra content like the the happy hour uh, the loudcast extra you can get a whole manner of wonderful things so go do and check that out uh, but for now carly would you be up for giving us a wee poem to round off the show Absolutely, I would. And yeah, Amazing. thank you again so much for, for having me. This is such a wonderful space for um, for artists to come on and, and discuss their work. And I am so honored and excited to be a part of it. Thank you for doing it. That's really, so nice. really thank That's you so for nice. doing it. Um, so yes, I will share um, a poem from Anastasia, Look in the Mirror. This is one of the, the pamphlets that we were talking about. And this is actually one of the poems we've talked about quite a bit. So I think it's an appropriate one to to pick. Um, so yes, I'm going to share a poem called, um, Reading Fifty Shades of Grey, if that's all right. Amazing. So, Reading Fifty Shades of Grey. It begins with looking in the mirror. On page one, our heroine, Anastasia, gives a bizarrely detailed catalog of her physical features as if she has never seen them before. 
I gaze at the pale brown-haired girl with blue eyes too big for her face staring back at me. Yes, Anastasia, that is called a reflection. When the light on the glass bounces back into your iris, it enables you to see you. But you don't care about you, which becomes evident in chapter two when you meet Christian Grey and he says, Anastasia, tell me more about yourself. And you say, well, there's not much to know. And those words frightened me. I mean, how can a main character actually say that? Anastasia, according to this book, you love Victorian novels. You bite your lip incessantly. You have a very unusual relationship with your inner goddess, which you say is part of your subconscious. Although the very fact that you are conscious of your subconscious is confusing to me. You can have orgasms at the drop of a hat. I mean, all of that is incredibly interesting. Maybe you are 50 shades of blue when you're reading books, a deep sapphire melancholy for the memories of when you read them with your grandmother or a light turquoise for the possibility that you might someday write them. Maybe sex makes you feel 50 shades of red. The dark burgundy of painting over reality or the pulsing pink of fleeting intimacy. Write yourself out of this messed up story where he gets to be like an entire paint catalog and you aren't even worthy of a detailed backstory. Look, I mean, we know that this is a book about sex. Okay, and that we're supposed to live vicariously through another insert yourself here heroine, but I don't want to read books about women who don't recognize their own identities literally, like in mirrors, or perceive that they have value until they are viewed by billionaire men who make them sign contracts and tell them how many times to go to the gym. I want stories about women who recognize that within their own reflections are so many shades depending on the angle or depending on the day or depending on the way that you choose to construct and perceive the ever-shifting kaleidoscope called your identity, Anastasia. Look in the mirror until you can see that the pale brown-haired girl is too many shades to accurately tally. So when someone asks you to tell them more about yourself, Anastasia, you can say, I don't know where to begin. Thank you. <sighs> Amazing stuff, Carly. Amazing stuff. I, I love that poem. And it's such a, a good illustration of uh, a bunch of the things we were talking about. You know what I mean? Like putting that, you know, sort of real hard-hitting, you know, like, actual thoughts on the matter into the middle of the piece and like you know it, it's easy to remember these poems and the bits that stand out are like oh Carly's so funny and the funny voice and the great lines and stuff but there's always that real like you know heart of of, of something you know important and real that you're trying to say it is yeah stunning work sublimely done wonderful stuff thank you so much for joining us on the loudcast Carly I am excited to hear another poem and have more chat over on the loudcast extra uh, but until next Next time, guys, go and check out all of Carly's stuff. Uh, there will be links and descriptions below where you can find her on Twitter and her website and her blog and everything we didn't get a chance to get to. But go and check it all out. Uh, it, is, it is phenomenal stuff. And until next time, guys, this has been the Loudcast. Thank you so much for checking it out, for stopping by, for hitting like and scribe, subscribe before you go or following us and giving us a rate and review on your podcast platform of choice. We will see you next time. Here's a goodbye from me and Carly. Say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.